it's now. Okay, so, but uh, Jimena, I have a doubt here because, uh, so I have two screens and maybe it's better if I just have one screen because mm -hmm. if I share, I mean, if, I, if I'm sharing my screen, uh, I don't know which one of, 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 the, of the two you are going to see. <laughs> okay. Let's I, check what happens. Yeah. yeah. No, okay, and I, I, I'm going to disconnect one of the screens, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, sure. I can. I I, I can start. Uh, my presentation is my, my presentation is in Spanish, and the slides are in English. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. As we have suggested, you can use either Spanish or English for the presentations. Okay. Empiezo. Yes, please. Bueno, pues buenos días a todos y gracias por, por contar conmigo para este encuentro virtual que, que aborda aspectos muy interesantes para mi investigación, como es la, la gestión del patrimonio cultural y el, y el, acceso, y el acceso abierto. Susana, todavía eh, no vemos la pantalla. ¿Ah, no? Uh -uh. Espérate. Eh, ¿Cómo tengo que hacer? Abajo, donde pone compartir pantalla. Yo tengo eh, record, chat, share, participants, share. invite, share. share. Ah, mira, ves, tengo desktop one o desktop two. Vale, uh, pues share, ¿no? Vale, now ¿Sí? you're ready. ¿Sí, me veis? Yes. Ok, muy bien, pues le pongo, le pongo así. Bueno, pues este, mi idea hoy es eh, compartir eh, un proyecto digital personal con el que he empezado a trabajar en estos últimos meses y que combina patrimonio histórico textual y se inspira en, en una filosofía de acceso eh, y código abierto. Para ello he preparado unas diapositivas en inglés y mi presentación va a ser en, va a ser en español. Entonces, mi, mi proyecto lleva el nombre de eh, CORBIO, que es una, un acrónimo de um, Corpus of Medieval and Early Modern Biographies o Corpus de Biografías Medievales y Renacentistas. Y, eh, y como digo, eh, se encuentra en sus inicios. Yo diría casi que está en, en, uno, en una fase de conceptualización todavía. La idea es publicar un archivo digital de colecciones biográficas escritas entre los siglos XIV y XVI y difundirlo en línea para, para la comunidad científica con el fin de poder buscar y consultar, leer, usar y reutilizar eh, esos textos y datos relacionados tanto con los autores o biógrafos, con los biografiados o personajes y con las obras eh, biográficas, ¿no? es decir, con las propias biografías. Entonces, en general, y para daros una idea de, del contexto que estoy trabajando, la biografía es un género ¿no? que, que fluctúa entre la literatura y la historia, y los autores tienen a veces aspiraciones eh, literarias y a, y a su vez también pretenden transmitir unos hechos históricos eh, verídicos, ¿no? sobre todo cuando el biografiado corresponde a una persona real y no, y no de ficción. ¿no? Para que se hagan una idea del tipo de obra con la que estoy trabajando, piensen por ejemplo en obras como el libro de las claras y virtuosas mujeres de Álvaro de Luna, en que se recogen decenas de biografías tanto de mujeres reales como de ficción. O, por ejemplo, el libro de los claros varones de Castilla, de Fernando del Pulgar, que publicó en 1486 con las biografías de los personajes que él consideraba eh, los más importantes de la, de la época. Se trata de galerías de personajes que transmiten, en el fondo, modelos de comportamiento y roles sociales y colecciones de textos realmente interesantes desde el punto de vista de la historia cultural. Entonces, para llevar a cabo eh, mi proyecto, yo propongo tres etapas o tres líneas de trabajo que a veces se, se, se solapan y qué es lo que me gustaría comentar eh, en, esta, en esta breve presentación. ¿no? En primer lugar está el diseño y la implementación de una base de datos eh, relacional. Uno de los primeros problemas que afronté aquí fue si debía crear una aplicación web desde cero 
o bien recurrir a un gestor de contenidos, lo que llaman en inglés un content management system, ¿no? En mi caso, he optado por utilizar Drupal, ¿no? que es un CMS de código libre. Y aunque es algo complicado al inicio, realmente es una herramienta muy poderosa y flexible, mucho más, por ejemplo, que otros CMS como el WordPress. Eh, además, Drupal se basa en, en MySQL, que es el programa libre más conocido para la creación de bases de datos relacionales. Una base de datos para un proyecto como este eh, es inevitable porque necesito ordenar y conectar eh, autores o biógrafos, obras o biografías y personajes o biografiados. Eh, cada una de estas, de estas tres piezas, ¿no? autores, obras y personajes, eh, tiene campos diferentes que deben ir conectados eh, unos con otros, ¿no? por, por, como las fechas, o los lugares de publicación, el lugar de nacimiento, el lugar de muerte, etc. Después, en segundo lugar, está, eh, en segundo lugar está la creación de... Eh, es decir, al ser un archivo digital, debía también concebirse una gestión, una gestión eficaz de, eh, de los textos, ¿no? de los textos de las biografías propiamente, propiamente dichas. Para ello, los textos se, se ofrecen básicamente en dos, en dos formatos. En, en un primer momento, los textos se trabajan en texto plano eh, y una vez listos, se, eh, son codificados en TEI. Ahora voy a hablar, eh, voy a retomar este, este aspecto. Y después hay una tercera fase, eh, que es con la que estoy menos familiarizada de momento, que, eh, que consiste en implementar los protocolos de la web semántica a partir de las informaciones ya existentes sobre autores, obras y personajes. ¿no? El objetivo es el de reutilizar todo el trabajo que muchas instituciones culturales han hecho ya uh, con su patrimonio cultural, ¿no? utilizando, por ejemplo, pues, identificadores únicos para eh, los autores o para, o para las obras. ¿no? Entonces, en cuanto a la creación del corpus, la labor más tediosa eh, es la recuperación de las fuentes primarias. Eh, en mi caso, de los textos. Aquellos de vosotros familiarizados con esta tarea sabrán que nos, encontramos con, que nos podemos encontrar con varias situaciones. ¿no? En el mejor de los casos, podemos encontrar el texto en línea, y ya sea en una reproducción digital más o menos buena, eh, o bien directamente nos podemos encontrar el texto digital, ¿no? ya sea en un formato HTML o incluso en formatos de texto plano, aunque eso todavía es raro. En mi caso, muchas reproducciones las encuentro en el Internet Archive, eh, en bibliotecas digitales como la Biblioteca Nacional de España, la de Castilla y León, la de Cataluña o incluso también en el mismo Google Books. Eh, los textos digitales, en cambio, es decir, propiamente el texto, eh, estos son más difíciles de encontrar y algunos los he podido recuperar en la Biblioteca Augustana o, eh, por ejemplo, en el Digital Library of Old Spanish uh, Text. Eh, entonces, si solo tenemos una reproducción digital, no nos queda de otra que, eh, pasar un, que utilizar un OCR, ¿no? el Optical Character Recognition que conlleva siempre un proceso de corrección, eh, dependiendo de la calidad y del año de la edición. Y en fin, en el peor de los casos, eh, podemos encontrar, por ejemplo, la obra puede estar en un manuscrito en el que el OCR poco, poco nos ayuda y, y no hay más que, pues, que transcribirlo a mano en ese caso. ¿no? Eh, después, para el procesamiento del texto, como he dicho, utilizo en un primer momento el texto plano. ¿Y por qué? Pues porque facilita la manipulación de los textos, eh, porque ese es el formato pivote, ese es el formato más simple y que, eh, eh, y que permite eh, usos posteriores. ¿no? También porque ocupa poquísimo espacio y se gana en velocidad de consulta y gestión. Y, y, y además, digo, con ese, con ese formato después es el que te permite también la posterior mm, eh, aplicación ¿no? de técnicas de minería de texto, como puede ser eh, la estilometría o como puede ser el topic modeling. Eh, y después también, en cuanto a la codificación de los textos, es decir, por un lado tengo los textos en punto .txt, en, en formato plano, y después también en, eh, en co codificados. ¿no? Y estoy llevando a cabo 
un marcado eh, a través del, de, con el lenguaje XML, el Extensible Markup Language, siguiendo las guías directrices de la Text and Coding Initiative. Esto permite que los textos sean buscables a partir de su semántica, por ejemplo, nombres de lugar o de personas, fechas, etc. Y además facilita, sobre todo eso, eh, para lo que a mí me interesa, facilita la presentación del texto como una edición digital, ¿no? ofreciendo así una versión más agradable eh, para la lectura, donde uno puede añadir pequeñas notas o puede hacer unas pequeñas ventanas para, eh, para estos elementos que hemos, que hemos marcado. ¿no? Y aquí, una vez más, el objetivo es el uso de estándares web que permitan la interoperabilidad y el reuso de los materiales eh, del archivo digital. ¿no? Eh, en fin, y esta es la parte, insisto, más nueva para mí, el proyecto tiene una parte de web semántica, ¿no? donde la idea es la reutilización de los datos eh, ya producidos y disponibles en, en línea. Por ejemplo, si estoy haciendo la ficha de un autor, en este caso Hernán, Hernán Pérez del Purgar, que es el que veis aquí en, en la diapositiva, lo que me interesa primeramente es recuperar las informaciones ya existentes en las plataformas, como por ejemplo la Wikipedia, eh, Wikidata, en catálogos de autoridad, conectarlo con catálogos de autoridades como el DIAF, por ejemplo, o ver, por ejemplo, también qué tiene el, el, la Biblioteca Nacional a través de su sistema de, 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 de datos abiertos, ¿no? sobre ese autor en particular. Ese es el ejemplo más claro de no reinvención de la rueda, ¿no? que, que en la mayoría de los casos mis autores y los biografiados están ya presentes, por ejemplo, en Wikipedia, y presentan en la parte inferior, sobre todo está en la parte inferior, eh, un control de autoridades, Ese que es, que es la, el, el rectángulo este que veis en la parte inferior, ¿no? Eh, que, hay, que en mi caso esos son todos los identificadores que conectan eh, ese personaje o ese trabajo con otros proyectos y otras, eh, y otras iniciativas. ¿no? Eh, y bueno, eso, eso es, es todo, más o menos lo que había preparado. Espero dado, haberos dado una idea un poco rápida de, de mi trabajo y de cómo... Eh, y de cómo intento trabajar ¿no? con textos y datos históricos, y siempre bajo una filosofía de acceso y código abierto. Eh, entonces, yo ahora no sé si, 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 si las preguntas me imagino que se hacen después, uh -huh. o, como, uh -huh. o, o como quieran. Yeah. Yo estaré contenta de responder cualquier cosa o de recibir cualquier feedback. Uh -huh. I have a question for you, but afterwards, and of, as I was saying, uh, people can also send questions when we show this next week in the Science Week that we have here in Argentina and in other events. Thank you, Susana. This was great. Thank Thanks you. Thank you so much to you. Thank you. So uh, now if you can like stop sharing your screen. Thank you. No, I'm going and, to share it now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah. Sadeep, do you want to continue with your presentation? Yes, I can. Um... I still need, I think Susanna needs to stop sharing so I can share my screen. Mm -hmm. Yes, Meanwhile, Susanna, I can, can you? A small intro. Can you exit your screen, Susanna? Susana, are you seeing something that uh, that says stop sharing screen in, in Zoom? You should be clicking on that. Okay, I'm going to... Yeah. I did it for you. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> thanks, Susana, and thanks, Adip. Uh, If you want to introduce yourself and start with a presentation, your time. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Sadeep Gill. I'm from India, and I work with the Wikimedia Foundation as part of the community program team. And my title is Program Officer Glam and Underrepresented Knowledge. And I mainly work around Wikisource, uh, and I like kind of 
documenting how our communities around the world are using big source and about uh, two different case studies source and one of the Punjabi wiki source, um, which also happens to be my native language, Punjabi. Um, okay, so let's start with it. As you can see, this is the, the main page of the Spanish wiki source. It is one of the um, 70 plus wiki sources that we have in around the, uh, around the globe in various languages. And we also have a multilingual wiki source besides that. Um, so what, what is wiki source? Wikisource is a platform where uh, we provide high quality um, transcribed source texts. And interestingly, it is one of the, like the one of the only projects which, which provides this or which enables communities to do this kind of work um, in, in, in their languages, which, which, which don't have any other transcription project. For example, um, if, if, if I talk about the Punjabi language or if we talk about uh, the Breton language uh, language from France, Wikisource is the only project where these languages are transcribed. So, so, so that's what makes it really important. And, and also uh, being a part of the, the larger Wikimedia ecosystem Wikisource uh, is a very perfect onboarding platform for newbies um, into the Wikimedia movement. So they can learn to transcribe and, and also learn basic we use um, on all our platforms. So they can learn those basic things and then they can move on to other platforms if they would like to. And yeah, so now I'll talk about uh, the first um, which is the Armenian wiki source. So this is an image from uh, one of the wiki clubs, uh, one of the 15 wiki clubs they have all around uh, Armenia. And what they do in these wiki clubs is they introduce uh, and wiki source is one of the, um, the major projects that these uh, school children work with. They they focus on digitizing works, uh, which are sometimes part of their curriculum as well. And hence it becomes, uh, I, it becomes a platform where they can learn to type um, Armenian language on the internet, which they usually don't do um, on, on, on the web as such. So they are using Wikisource to learn how to type in their language and they're also studying uh, texts, transcribing them, which are part of their curriculum. And at the same time, they're learning other important uh, digital skills. So that's uh, what the Armenian community is doing. And then these are Wikisource texts. Uh, these make more than 10% uh, more than of the Wikipedia articles on Armenian Wikipedia comprise of information and sources from wikis from Armenian wiki source. So that's something, uh, yeah, really interesting. And now I'm going to talk about something very different, uh, which is uh, which is the Punjabi case study, um, because Armenians on the one hand they had the National Library of Armenia, they, the works were digitized. The only, uh, the thing they did was to work with students and to uh, to transcribe those texts on Wikisource. But Punjabi, on the other hand, it did not have a lot of uh, digitized works available on the web. So a, a Wikimedian from the Punjabi community, she got it, she applied for a, a, a rapid grant uh, to the Wikimedia Foundation. She got that grant and, a, 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 and as a part of that grant, she worked, with, uh, she worked in a very uh, old library um, in this city, small city called Patiala, which is my hometown as well. And she worked with the library and she digitized more than 40 works. And, and then those works were put onto commons. Some of them really interesting, like this one work, uh, which was hugely uh, talked about in the Punjabi, uh, in the history of Punjabi literature, but no one ever saw uh, or read that work. 
um, and then that was also part of that uh, digitization. Yeah. So it's um, so it's it's this work, Chamberdi and Kalyan. It's basically um, a short story collection uh, adapted from short stories of Tolstoy's stories. So so basically, sh what she did was she digitized those works. She, um, she put them on Wikisource, and then. Uh, we did a wiki source contest and contest was to engage with uh, the larger wiki source community also get some newbies um, from the Punjabi wiki source and we worked for, for 40 days on these 40 books and at the end of that um, those 40 days we had more than 6,000 uh, pages transcribed on Punjabi Wikisource, which made uh, Punjabi Wikisource in the last year uh, the fastest growing Wikimedia project. With with 800% of growth, Punjabi became the fastest growing Wikimedia project in the world. And and besides that, uh, Wikisource in Marathi, Kannada, and Assamese these three Indic languages, they have also grown more than 100% in the last year. And just more, um, more context about it is, is the fact that uh, almost all of these languages, they don't have a lot of source text available on the web. So Wikisource becomes a perfect platform where they can bring their source text online and then think about how they wanna use this, uh, this information uh, how they can connect it with uh, Wikipedia at times, and maybe in terms of sources, uh, references, and yeah, and, and that's why there is so much interest in uh, in Wikisource in emerging communities because this is the only project which provides uh, you know any language to come up with and start working on uh, documenting their textual sources. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Adip. It was great. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, Paul, do you want to continue with your presentation, a brief like introduction and, and start your presentation, please? Sure, I'll do an intro and then I'll share my screen, yeah. Okay. Um, start now. Hi, I'm Paul Flemons. I work for the Australian Museum in Sydney, Australia, and I manage uh, the digital collections and citizen science programs there. Um, I'll share my screen now. Uh, you see that okay? Yes. Uh, you still see that okay? Yeah, we're seeing the presentation perfectly. Okay, good, good. Um, okay. So um, I want to talk today about Digivol, which uh, is Digivol Digital Volunteers, which is a, a crowdsourcing website for um, for museums and other collections around the world that want to have their collections digitised. Um, through Digivol, you can uh, transcribe collection labels, you can transcribe historical documents, and you can tag images of wildlife or other types of images. So what is Digivol? It's an open access crowdsourcing platform for transcribing text and tagging images. What do you need to you what do you need to use Digivol? You uh, need di images containing information you want extracted and someone who can upload the images, create a tutorial and provide guidance and feedback to the volunteers. Other than that, it's an open access platform which uh, anybody can use. Um, you just need to contact us here at the museum to um, uh, start the process and we can provide guidance for you. So there's some big institutions around the world that are using Digivol, um, Natural History Museum in, in London, uh, New York Botanic Gardens. Um, it, it's not just um, Natural History Museums, however, we've also got the National Gallery of Australia has used um, Digivol, Living Archive of Aboriginal Languages in Australia. Um, so it's a mixture of natural history type um, uh, digitization and that of, I guess, the digital humanities. So libraries in Tasmania there has also used Digivol. 
Um, one of the things through Digivol is we use um, gamification to, uh, for our volunteers to keep them engaged and um, interested in, in the different projects on there. And there are many different projects, but so um, each volunteer gets a status as a, an expedition leader if they've done the most transcriptions or a technical officer or whatever. So it's, that's um, a mechanism for giving them um, uh, status, I guess, within the, the site. Um, the, the process of um, transcription has two stages. So we have transcribers and we have validators. So transcribers, anybody can transcribe. They just need to register on Digivol and the volunteers transcribe whatever uh, project they want to be involved in. And then we, we choose the best of the transcribers and we give them permission to validate. And uh, many of the validators then become experts in that particular area of uh, or that particular document there. Um, they're validated. Uh, each volunteer has a profile and they can earn badges which um, represent the amount of work they've done on the platform um, and uh, many of the volunteers have done many many tasks. Each task, a task might be a label transcription, it might be a page transcription or it might be a tag of an animal. Uh, I'll just run through the different templates. So Digivol is based on different templates uh, there are many different templates, but I'll go through four examples. Uh, this is an example of a natural history one where um, this one in particular is transcribing the information from label of the butterfly and the volunteers enter the information into the different text fields there. Um, some examples of projects currently online uh, is one from Kew Gardens. It's very, very relevant to this particular um, geography, I guess, of the area that the Humanities Commons has been held in. It's, it's about uh, collecting information from the Kew Gardens about the, uh, the uh, plants in the, in, in the Amazon. Another one is mineral collections of the Australian Museum. So that would be labels of minerals from the Australian Museum. The next template I want to talk about is probably more relevant is the capture of text data from, um, from diaries, etc. Um, very simple data entry. The markup is very simple. Um, uh, and it's simply capturing the data from different texts into a verbatim text field. Examples of, of uh, projects that use that template are transcribing language texts of Aboriginal peoples in Australia. Um, uh, Hobart, uh, the, the legal documents and legal proceedings from court cases, um, uh, diaries, etc., of um, co collectors from different collections. So they're actual not, they're not labels, but actual um, field notes from diaries of, of scientists through the, through, through the ages. Um, another example of um, <clears throat> a, zo a zoologist who um, his, his diaries are kept here at the museum and they were transcribed through Digivol. Um, South Africa, South African field notes from uh, Herberia, um, another example of the types of projects. And something as simple as a, a local council. So the city of Parramatta is a local council in Sydney and they put their minute books up, historical minute books up and they're transcribed through Digivol as well. So there's a whole range of different types of institutions and projects that have been capturing their, their, their um, text through Digivol. Um, <clears throat> uh, a third template type I wanted to talk about was uh, a question based template type where um, the, uh, Questions can be asked about each image. And um, in this particular um, slide here, there's, you'll see there's seven steps at the top there. Each one of those steps, uh, one to six, represents a question that the volunteer is asked to answer in relation to the image. Um, and you can see there the, the answers to those questions in screen seven, which is a summary of the information they've captured for uh, the project. So that's an interpretation process of um, what's in the image uh, by the volunteers. And that, that project was uh, from the National Gallery of Australia, a uh, photographic in indexing project. Um, another interesting project is a uh, garbology research project in the Galapagos Islands where we're having volunteers um, identify plastics in images and uh, answer questions about the possible origins of those plastics in, in an effort to understand how the plastics are getting to those, uh, to the Galapagos Islands, and then um, 
feeding into uh, decision making around handling that situation. Um, my favourite, I guess, of the templates is the, is the one based around animals, uh, where it's, it could be used effectively for tagging any types of images. Um, but in this case, where um, the camera trap images from national parks, etc., where we put the image up and we ask the volunteers to identify the animals that occur in that image, selecting from a, a pick list of uh, photographs there on the right. Um, and there are many interesting um, projects relating to animals which um, involve the use of camera traps from uh, national parks, etc., uh, which um, many volunteers get involved in and, and spend a lot of time and a lot of um, contribution to projects that um, run through Digivol. So that's uh, just, I wanted to give a rundown of Digivol. It's a pro, it's a a platform that any institution can use around the world. Um, it's open access, it's free to use, and um, it's, uh, it's helped many institutions around the world um, digitize their collections. I do. Thank you, Paul. It's a very nice project. Um, may I ask some Questions, as, as, as I told you, questions will like be later, uh, will may uh, also be sent to you. But I have like some questions for each of you that I was thinking when you were like doing your presentations. Susanna, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I was thinking while Sadip was speaking, are you planning also to uh, contribute to, for instance, I was thinking about your biographies. Do you have all the biographies there, for instance, in Wikipedia, or were you thinking of also contributing to Wikipedia through your project? Because I think that one interesting, like liaison in what Sadip was talking about, and also Paul, that's more related to citizen science, would be like your project also, like maybe contributing to, to sources where you are taking material from there too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that would that would be great. That would be a great idea. I mean, first of all, I mean, uh, as I said at the beginning, this is a this is a project that is in the very very beginning, but and and the idea is to have um, different formats for for the text. And you're right. Since I'm harvesting information from Wikidata and Wikisource, uh, so uh, that would be great to also give mm -hmm. my text to uh, to Wikisource, especially. Um, I was I, I, for I, students, I, don't you think that maybe students doing some kind of like um, working on Wikipedia on on different biographies could also uh, be a good way of like maybe I don't know engaging them in your project. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I always think about my students and how to engage them in my project, right? Uh, and yeah, definitely that would be an idea. I mean, for example, this year I have been working with some of them, with, with some of my students, uh, encoding the text. And um, I have to say that it have, it have worked a lot. Uh, one thing that I have not tried yet is to work, um, to work with them uh, with uh, Wikipedia, for example. But that would be, but that would be yeah that would be a great initiative i think because that way i mean they um get into the wiki world and um they they get digital skills and they they get to know these these uh, these biographies they get to know also cultural history and i think that would be that would be a a, a good idea and now i know more or less uh, i mean now if, if i if uh now that i that i've listened the the, the uh, so the presentation. So now I have an, uh, an entry point, right? So I will, I will contact you, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> yeah, feel free to contact me anytime. I can, Thank like, you. Uh, I, I, I can provide you more uh, case studies around, especially like around the work you, you want to do. So yeah, yeah, feel free to contact me anytime. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Sadip, may I ask you a question about the digitizing, the digitization that you were talking about? How did you, mm -hmm. how did you do that? Did you do that with the Wikimedia Foundation too? Yeah. So basically, um, as part of the project grant, um, we got a scanner. Uh, by we, I mean uh, the Punjabi community. The Punjabi community, uh, it got a scanner. Um, 
and then using that scanner, um, we worked with the library and the library was also willing to give a person um, who would scan those works then. And what we did was to create a list and prioritize works that we want to scan. And there were thousands of books, but we decided to work with those 40 books that we, we identified were uh, public domain. And, and also we worked with them, we scanned them, and then yeah, like everything else and got them to commons, which is our platform, Wikimedia Commons, where we upload the books. And then from commons, we create transcriptions on Wikisource. Great. And was it those ones to it yourself scanners? Yeah, these were scanned by uh, us, yeah, like by the community, by the mm -hmm. librarians, or yeah. Great, thank you. And Paul, I have an, a question about how, like, <laughs> how do you recruit the volunteers in the in your projects? Do you do this in libraries? Do you work with specific communities? Because uh, it's, we, need, we need a lot of different strategies. Each of the institutions that uses Digivol, we ask to promote through their social media and through their own um, mechanisms for publicity, I guess, their own comms channels, um, to bring uh, volunteers to Digivol. Uh, we work through the members, we work through social media, we have a, a website, um, we work through... Um, uh, social security uh, organizations which where people if they to to get their social security check they need to um, do a certain number of hours of, of volunteer work and we get quite a few people doing that uh, we work with volunteer organizations uh, publicizing through their networks so as people anybody that's wanting to volunteer um, can find their way to digital through those volunteer organizations um, so a whole range of different ways of um, attracting volunteers, but um, you need to be continually thinking of new ways because um, there, of the 4,000 or more people that have come to Digivol, um, several hundred stay and, and have long-term impact, but quite a few uh, will will turn over quite quickly. And it's every, it's, it's just those people that, uh, the more people we reach through our promotion, um, the more likely Hood will get uh, a few of those people that stay a long time and, and contribute a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, your your specific project at a museum, how long has it been like now, like running? How it's now eight, eight years? Eight years it's been running now, so it's quite a long lived um, crowdsourcing project. Yeah. And we've had, <clears throat> I think, nearly a thousand different projects run on Digivol from different institutions around the world. We've had about 40 different institutions hosting their, their projects on Digivol and um, across about seven or eight different countries. So it's been, and of that, the ta number of tasks done is about 1.5 million tasks, which is quite a significant yeah. contribution to digitizing collections around the world. Mm -hmm. Good. Any questions here? Do you want to make or comment or something? I spoke Spanish, I might have some questions. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way of practicing Spanish. <laughs> so, friends, thank you for being here. And um, I hope you will hear from us soon. Uh, thank you very much again. And I think we will try to upload these presentations as soon as possible. We will let you know. That. Thanks okay. again. Yeah, that's great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you so much. Gracias. Thank you. Hasta nice pronto. Bye bye. Bye. Adiós. 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 Hasta luego. Adiós.